Okay, so it's time to quieten down now, please, because we need to get started. I realize it's an exciting day, being a Wednesday and all. So, we are going to talk today... We are going to talk today about a whole bunch of stuff to do with the atmosphere, okay? And I don't want to have to rush through this too much, so it may be that we don't quite get to the end, and if we don't, we'll finish on Friday. Um, also, I had a request from someone um, that they would really quite like uh, a bit more guidance about which sections of the textbook to read. So I've uploaded a very pre preliminary study guide with suggestions for which bits of the textbook you can skip. Um, and that is designed to help you as we go through this next section. Okay? Um, and also, from, remember for discussions this week, the activity that will allow you to gain credit for attending discussions isn't going to be done in discussion time. It's something that you can do any time in groups of one to four, and it doesn't need to be people from your particular discussion group. Um, but the point of this is that the TAs will be in the room in that discussion time, and they are very happy to go through things like questions about the midterm, or questions about quizzes, or if, they, if you want to get started on your concept maps and think about the links um, between different aspects. So use this week to sort of really pin down what you don't understand so far so that you don't get too lost as we move on now into the atmosphere and hydrosphere. Okay? Does anyone have questions about this stuff? Okay. So atmospheric pressure. We're going to talk firstly about the structure of the atmosphere. And we're going to talk about two different ways that we look at the structure of the atmosphere. The first is atmospheric pressure. Um, and as anyone knows who's tried to climb a mountain, it's not so easy when you get up high. Um, and it's not just because you're unfit, it's because it actually should get harder as you go up. And that's because with increasing altitude, air pressure decreases. Okay? Um, and air density decreases associated with that, or because of that air density changing, then the pressure that those molecules exert as they move around changes. And why does this happen? Well, if I got three of you down to the front and told you to stand on each other's shoulders, who would feel the most pressure? The one at the top or the one at the bottom? The one at the bottom. Why? Because they're feeling the weight of the people above. So the person at the top is fine, they're happy, whereas the person at the bottom is feeling all of that weight. And it's exactly the same thing with the atmosphere. What happens is, if we look at the, the air, the air molecules, the gas molecules at the base of the atmosphere, they're, they're compressed, they're feeling the weight of all the extra atmosphere above. Okay? And that forces all of those gas molecules closer together. And it's those gas molecules sort of moving around that exerts pressure. So right at the base of the atmosphere, all of those gas molecules are feeling that overlying weight are compressed together, and we get more air density and more air pressure at the base there. Whereas at the top, those little gas molecules are at the very top, they don't feel any weight or very little weight from what's above them, which in some cases is nothing if they're at the very top. And so they're more spread out. They're not as compressed. Okay? So, tell me, this is a beautiful picture of Mount Everest. Why is the top of Mount Everest called the death zone, apart from to make it sound dramatic? Is it because it's too cold for humans to survive more than a few hours? Is it because the air pressure at that altitude is very low? Or because the proportion of oxygen in the air changes? What's the main reason that you would be unhappy if I put you at the top of Mount Everest? Few more seconds. Okay. So, ah, I asked this really mean question to try and catch you. Okay. It's a, an ongoing trend. So yes, it's very cold at the top. We can be cold in Greenland. We can be cold in Antarctica. We can be cold in very cold in parts of Canada. It doesn't really matter as long as we're prepared. The main reason 
why your body basically starts dying when it's at the top of Mount Everest is that the pressure is lower and because the pressure is lower you're breathing in less oxygen. Now this is something that catches people out each time, in fact it caught out 50% of you, so you're not alone, in that if we go up in the atmosphere until we get really to the very, very top, if we look at, if we just take some air, we're going to see the same 78% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen, something else argon, okay? We take air at any particular altitude, it's always going to have the same ratio of gases. So it's not that there's less oxygen in the air at that particular altitude, it's that the pressure is less. And so if you try and breathe in a litre of air, there's going to be less individual air molecules for, for you to, to absorb. Does that make sense now? Yeah? Good. So don't get caught out, and I'm sure if you ask your friends, they'd all get caught out the same way. So that's pressure, and you can see that it just decreases sort of with a curve, an exponential curve as we go uh, up. But we also want to look at temperature, and temperature is really the main way that we talk about different layers in our atmosphere. Um, and we are down here in the troposphere, um, and unless we have any uh, astronauts or test pilots in the audience, then really that's where you've always been. Um, the stratosphere is really actually not somewhere that humans ever go. Even in commercial airline flights, you really need to be an Air Force test pilot before you get up there. Okay? But you can see that the red line there shows temperature. And as we know, temperature in our bit of the atmosphere, in the troposphere, right down at the ground, decreases as you go up. It gets colder as you go up the mountains. Later on this winter, we'll be able to look across and we'll see snow at the top of the mountains, even if it's a nice day here. So we know that temperature decreases as we go up in altitude. But only to a certain point. Because when we hit the stratosphere at maybe sort of 10 to 15 kilometers up, then actually the temperature starts increasing again. And that's weird, right? Why would the temperature start increasing again? Why is the stratosphere important? What is in the stratosphere that we like? Ozone. Absolutely, is where the ozone layer is. And what is that ozone doing? It protects us, yeah. It protects us from ultraviolet radiation. How does it do that? It does that by absorbing that incoming ultraviolet radiation. So it stops it sort of penetrating down to the surface, and it does that by absorbing it. If it's absorbing ultraviolet energy, what's going to happen? It's going to heat up. Okay, so that's why in our stratosphere there, where a lot of our ozone is, it's absorbing energy, and so we actually start increasing our temperature again. But at a certain point, because we're just sort of getting thinner and thinner and thinner air as we go up, then that doesn't really help us anymore. And at that point, we start decreasing again in the mesosphere. And then when we get up really, really, really high in the atmosphere, thermosphere, more or less where a lot of our satellites are orbiting isn't actually in space. It's in the very outer reaches of our atmosphere. There's so little gas up there that actually it interacts very strongly with incoming radiation um, and can get very hot. So, here's our troposphere. It's where basically all our weather happens. Most of the a huge proportion of the gas that actually makes up our, our atmosphere is in the troposphere because it's being compressed, because air is compressible and it's denser down at the surface. Um, and so it contains about 80% of the mass. And there's really vigorous movement um, and sort of vertical movement. Um, and that's sort of the main one that we're going to think about. These other ones, the stratosphere is important because of our ozone layer. Um, the mesosphere is, to be honest, a little bit boring. Um, not a lot happens. It's where meteorites burn up, but it's just sort of in the middle there. And then the thermosphere at the top, that's where our northern and southern lights are, the auroras. Um, and it extends really high, up to 500 kilometers, and there's hardly any gas molecules left at that point. And I want, and you can see, if you were in the top of the thermosphere, it would actually be, or you, the temperature would be higher than at the troposphere. Does that sound right? 
Doesn't sound right. And we have to start making a definition between temperature as the way we think of it and heat. Okay? Because both my little cup of coffee and my hot tub may have the same temperature, but which of them has more heat? The hot tub. The hot tub contains more heat because there's more of the substance. Okay? So temperature is just a measure scientifically when we use temperature. What we mean is how fast molecules are moving, how much kinetic energy, how much moving energy they have. Okay? And so the warmer a molecule is, the faster it's going. Okay? But if we talk about the amount of heat, which is what we perhaps more think of day to day when we use the word temperature, actually what we mean is the total kinetic energy. So if we add up all of the, the different energy of all of those molecules moving around. And so this is why the thermosphere can have a really high temperature. Because there may be only a few molecules moving around, and they can move really fast. But you wouldn't necessarily feel warm or alive if you were in the top of the thermosphere. Okay? So there's so few molecules up there. So I wanted to show you a little video, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I think this is really cool, and it has a little review of what we've just talked about. And I know that my atmosphere people have seen this before. On August 16th, 1960, long before man had set foot on the moon, military pilot Joe Kittinger took a solo journey to explore the heavens. Not in a rocket, but in a giant helium balloon to determine the risks of high altitude bailout from air or spacecraft. The balloon took Kittinger over 19 miles into the stratosphere. That's twice the height that I reached. Then Kittinger did something astonishing. He jumped. This is the actual moment. He fell to earth, reaching a speed of almost 620 miles an hour. And yet he had no sense of speed. I had no ripple of the of the fabric uh, uh, pressure suit, and I, I, it was a very weird sensation. I had no uh, no visual reference on it, so I thought I was really suspended in space. Kittinger had fallen at great speed as he plunged towards a troposphere, thick with clouds floating over a New Mexico desert. Finally, he opened his parachute. His jump remains the longest free fall in history. Fifteen minutes after he jumped, Kittinger was back on the ground. Falling from the upper reaches of the stratosphere, Kittinger had plummeted to 99% of the atmosphere's mass. Fifteen minutes before I'd been in the edge of space, now to be out in the Garden of Eden. It's a slightly different era then, cigarettes were fine. Okay, so I wanted to show you that because I think it really hammers home the point that that troposphere, you could see that that's where all the weather was, that's where all the clouds was, right down next to Earth's surface, that lowest 10 to 16 kilometers or so. And actually you can see how thin the atmosphere is at that altitude in the stratosphere, not even in the mesosphere or the thermosphere that really so much of the, the mass of the atmosphere is, is down low to us, um, and uh, it's really fun. So more recently, we have this guy, Felix Baumgartner, and he did this last year, and he broke the record uh, of Kittinger. So he jumped from 39 kilometers rather than 31, 
And it was all very spectacular and everything, but he did it with so much technology that it took the adventure out of it a little bit. So I still think that Kissinger is the real hero and completely crazy um, for doing that because he really had no idea what on earth was going to happen. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Okay. So, that was our little summary, that we have two ways of thinking about the structure of the atmosphere. First of all, with pressure, which decreases as we go up in the atmosphere, and also with temperature, which alternates between cooling and warming. Okay? So, let's think about our weather, because that's what we really care about day to day. So, remember, our atmosphere is what surrounds any particular sort of planet or celestial body. And when we talk about weather, usually what we mean is sort of five particular things. So it's the state of the atmosphere outside at this particular time. And things that we might use to describe that are things like the temperature. It's much colder today. Um, air pressure. Maybe, maybe you wouldn't yet, but you will. Humidity. Cloudiness. And wind speed and direction. Okay. Um, and when we talk about climate, what we talk about is the average weather over probably 30 minutes or so. 30 minutes, sorry, 30 years or so. Okay, so climate is the average weather in a particular place. Um, and there's this sort of clever quote that no one can quite say who said it, but is climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So when relatives come to visit me, they pack shorts and t-shirts, and then the, usual, the weather usually is like this, okay? So weather is what you get. Um, and here is a nice example. Does anyone know what this is a picture of, or where this was taken? Joshua tree, which is just two hours in land, and it shows this is weather. We would expect the, the, we the, the climate there to be hot and dry. Weather is what you get, which is little anomalies associated with that, okay? And we're going to talk today about two of these factors in particular, which is humidity and cloudiness, if we get there. So has anyone ever been across to the, the east coast, perhaps Florida, Georgia, somewhere around that, in, uh, in the middle of summer? What's it like? Pretty miserable? <laughs> yes, especially if you do anything. And that's because of the humidity. If you just look at the temperature in, in say, LA and the, the East Coast in the summer, then they can be really similar. The real difference is in the humidity, and we'll come on to why that's the case. So, first of all, this is all to do with water. Why do we care so much about water? Why am I going to be talking about water today? Anyone? <laughs> Obvious answer. We need it to survive, absolutely. And in particular, we use it a lot of it. And I have a little question for you. Of these various things, and atmosphere people don't give the game away, which of the following takes the most amount of water? So running your dishwasher every day for a month, manufacturing a cotton shirt, one eight ounce steak, or a cup of coffee? What do you think takes the most amount of water to make? more seconds. Okay, let's take a look. So most people would say running the dishwasher for a week, okay? Um, and certain people said C, possibly because they've taken a class with me before, because they would be right. That is how many gallons of water it takes to produce each of those. So your eight ounce steak took 1,232 gallons of water to produce, okay? And so this is the, the point that I want to make associated with this, is that we think of the water we use as in water in the shower, water in, so that runs from taps, or water we drink. A lot of the water that we end up using as humans is hidden. It's hidden in the products we use every day, in the clothes we wear, and what we eat, okay? So we need massive, massive, massive amounts of water. And in fact, the average Orange County resident uses 176 gallons of water a day. 
Okay? That was in 2005. It's probably pretty similar. We're, we're being quite good about trying to be water efficient. And remember, we live in a desert. South California is a desert. And so we have to think about where this water is coming from. And next week when we talk about the hydrosphere, we'll learn a bit more about where our water actually comes from. But in terms of understanding the atmosphere as part of the water cycle, what we really want to try and get at is we want to understand the role of that hydrologic cycle. Um, and in particular, Kurt and others study this stuff um, and are interested in trying to understand how it will change in the future. Because it's also pretty important for the Earth system. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Um, and water vapor, we've already said, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, but we want water vapor in our atmosphere. It's not something we want to get rid of. Um, and water is a really strange substance. Um, and at our particular pressures and temperatures, it can exist in three phases at the same sort of temperature. So if I had a block of ice in the room, I'd have ice plus liquid water plus water vapor. It can exist in all three states at our sort of room temperature. And the, the key thing about this is that the, the change of phase of water, so things like evaporation or condensation or melting, actually transfer a huge amount of energy. And in most cases, it's what fuels our climate system. The release of energy by uh, condensation of water vapor fuels hurricanes, these enormous, enormous features that are so destructive. Condensation. There's a huge amount of energy involved in the, the, transfer, the transformation of water uh, from one phase to another. OK, so here's our hydrologic cycle. We get evaporation from ocean sort of surfaces and also from land surfaces. Some of that can be just evaporation. But transpiration is that process where water evaporates from inside plant material, so through the pore spaces on leaves and things like that. Um, and then once it's in the atmosphere, it can exist as water vapor. And then also it can start condensing out to form clouds. Eventually it can fall out and either as rainfall, um, in which case it will perhaps sink into the ground. And a lot of our uh, fresh water in the world is actually groundwater. It's contained within the spaces of the rock. Um, and then it makes its way back to the ocean. And some of it gets sort of stuck in frozen form in the mountains for a while. So here, uh, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going over, over what melting and freezing is, but I wanted to point out these two arrows, sublimation and deposition, which you might not have heard before. Sublimation is when you take something from a solid and turn it straight into uh, a gas. And the other way around, which is deposition, is when you take a gas and you turn it directly into a solid without going through that liquid phase in the middle. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about two different types of heat transfer now, which is sensible heat. And sensible heat is a transfer of energy which results in a change of temperature. So an example might be when energy hits the concrete surface outside, that, that energy goes into raising the temperature of that concrete. But then we also have this thing called latent heat. And latent heat is the energy required to change the phase of a substance, or the energy released by the change of phase of a substance. OK. So here's sort of what I was talking about. So we have our three processes of heat transfer. We have conduction, convection, and radiation. And now our sensible heat flux. And so a few of you who did uh, the discussion group in second week, I think, will have encountered this before, the specific heat of something, which is that the energy needed to raise sort of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And that's different for different substances. So we know that water takes a long time to heat up, right? If we sit there trying to boil water in a pan, it takes forever, whereas the pan itself heats up a lot faster. OK? And that's because the different substances have a different specific heat. It's why when you go to the beach in the summer, by the end of the day, you have to like tiptoe across the sand because the sand is so hot, whereas the water still hasn't warmed up that much. Okay? 
So that's because these different substances have a different specific heat. And so 4,190 joules is what I would have to add to get one kilogram of water to go up in temperature by one degree. Okay? Um, and so what would it... You could imagine that if I added another lot of 4,190, I'd get two degrees. Okay? So it's a very simple mathematical uh, system there. Okay. And then we have our latent heat flux, which, remember, is what we do when we change the phase. And so you can see the latent heat of vaporization of water, so how much energy we'd have to put in to evaporate something, is 2.5 million joules per kilogram. So it's actually a lot more. And that energy doesn't disappear when, when that sort of happens, when that process happens. That energy is actually stored because we're breaking those molecules of liquid free and allowing them to move independently. And so that energy is actually being taken in by those molecules and contained now as they move around, which is why when they condense back again, they release that energy back into the system. Okay? Um, so energy is stored. Um, and so melting needs energy. You need to add energy to your little ice molecules to get them to break free and form a liquid. And this is why your drink gets cold when you put ice in it. Because that ice needs energy to melt. So as your ice cubes melt, they're taking in or they're using energy and, um, from your, the surrounding drink molecules of whatever you have. And so those surrounding drink molecules lose a bit of energy and so get cooler. They, they're moving less fast. They feel they are cooler. Um, the same thing happens for evaporation. It's why sweat cools you down. The evaporation of sweat needs energy. And that energy comes from the, your skin, your skin surface. Okay? So once that energy is taken in by those, those molecules to escape into a gas form, they're removing that energy from you. And that's why humidity feels so horrible, because when you have 100% humidity, then sweat can't evaporate and you don't cool down. It's why it's very dangerous to play sport in uh, some of these very humid places. And then the reverse goes for condensation and freezing. They actually release energy back into our environment. So, I want to talk about evaporation and condensation. And I know that you have a sense of what these processes are, but we have a few words that I need to introduce you to. So, first of all, my diagrams at the top show what would happen if I had a sealed container and I had some water in it or a liquid of any sort, and I had a sort of a lid over that liquid and absolutely nothing in the space above. What happens if you remove that lid is that evaporation occurs. And evaporation is simply the escape of these molecules that are moving around in the liquid and some of them escape out into that sort of uh, empty space. And as you imagine those molecules moving around all the time in that empty space or in that sort of space above the liquid, every now and again they'll crash back into the liquid surface. Okay, so that escape from the liquid is evaporation. When things crash back into the surface and, and join with the liquid again, it's condensation. And at first, when we remove that lid, there's nothing up there. So there's no real condensation happening at that time. So there's much, much more evaporation than there is condensation. But as time goes on, what happens is that we have this increased rate of evaporation, which is putting more and more molecules into the, that space. And the more molecules we have in that space, the more condensation we have. And so eventually what happens is we get um, a sort of an equilibrium developing between the amount of molecules escaping and the amount of molecules crashing back into the liquid surface. Okay? So that's equilibrium, when the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. And the pressure that those individual molecules in that space would exert on the edges of the, the can are what gives us our pressure. And so in this case, vapor pressure, which is that pressure of a gas above a liquid. Um, and because I said we can get to a point where evaporation is equal to condensation, at that point, we're not going to be changing the number of molecules 
in that space. And at that point, we say we've reached saturation. And the amount of pressure that you'd measure at that point is the saturation vapor pressure. Okay, so we're being consistent. And the key thing to know about saturation is that it changes based on temperature. So if your uh, airspace is colder, then you can get fewer and fewer molecules of water vapor into the atmosphere. If that temperature is really hot, you can get many, many more in there. Okay. So we're going to look at two particular ways we quantify or measure or, or talk about atmospheric moisture. The first is vapor pressure, which is what perhaps more the scientists use, and then relative humidity, which is what we tend to use when we talk about the weather. So firstly, vapor pressure is just what I talked about, is that pressure that's exerted by the molecules, and the more molecules you have, the more pressure you'll exert. And here's a little graph. Okay, and do you remember I said that saturation will change depending on the temperature, and so the vapor pressure will change depending on the, the temperature. So my red line here shows how much water vapor, or how much vapor pressure we can have in our sort of airspace at any particular temperature. So for example, at zero degrees Celsius, we could get five millibars of water vapor into our space above the liquid. If we go up to, say, 40 degrees Celsius, we could get 70, just above 70 millibars of water vapor into that space, okay? So, my little parcel of air is that little blue circle there. And it's, it's saturated right now, so our rate of condensation is equal to the rate of evaporation. So what happens if I increase the temperature? If I increase the temperature, could I get more water vapor in there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because as I move off that curve, as I move to warmer temperatures, well now I can get actually a lot more water vapor in if I can have more evaporation happening. So what happens if temperature decreases, though? But we can have less water vapor in there. We're super saturated. And if we're super saturated, we're going to have condensation. We're going to have some of that water vapor coming out of that space and, and sort of becoming liquid again. What happens if I added more water vapor to that particular thing? Yeah, it's the same thing. It would be super saturated again. So I could try adding more, but it would just condensate, condense out really more or less immediately. And so what we can do is we can look at those two particular areas on the graph, and we can say that if we plot the vapor pressure and temperature of our parcel of air, if it falls under that line, then we're undersaturated. If we have evaporation going on, if we have access to a water surface, we can get more water vapor into our air. But if we're above that red line, we're super saturated. And at that point, we're going to start condensing out some of that extra water vapor that we can't contain anymore. So we start getting condensation. Okay? Um, and so that's what I've got on there. So my question for you is, Here's my air now. It's at 30 degrees Celsius and has a vapor pressure of maybe about 5, 6, 7, 8, something like that. So at what temperature would this uh, parcel of air become saturated? So answer it by yourself first, and then I'll give you a chance to talk to your neighbors, OK? So we're not changing the vapor pressure, we're only changing temperature. I think I've got most answers. OK?
So there is a clear winner, but people don't seem entirely certain, which is 10 degrees Celsius, and they would be right, and I will show you why. Okay? I have another little figure. So to get it to be saturated, if we're not going to change the vapor pressure, we're not going to be moving that dot up and down on our graph. The vertical direction is if we add or lose water vapor. All we're doing is moving it sideways. Okay, backwards or forwards is what changes temperature. And if we move that little dot until it hits um, that red line, then if we look at, where, at what temperature that it crosses the red line, it's at 10 degrees Celsius. Does that make more sense now? Yeah? It takes a bit of thinking about it first, but I promise once you've got it, you've got it. And we call that particular temperature the dew point temperature. It's what temperature you'd start getting dew. Okay, so in the at night when it cools down, sometimes you get dew deposited on things. That's if it gets cold enough for this to happen. Okay? So that's our dew point temperature. So now let's look at the slightly more complicated one, which is relative humidity. And this is the one that we sense. What does it feel like during Santa Ana winds when it's when they're so really going, apart from windy? really dry. You feel yourself shriveling up almost, right? And it's because the relative humidity is really low. It maybe gets as low as 5% sometimes. If you've ever been across to the east coast, then you can get really high, sort of 90% or so sometimes. And that's miserable, okay? Because you can't evaporate the sweat off your surface and cool down. So, my little formula for relative humidity is the actual vapor pressure and what I mean by that is what I tell you is in the air, okay? So it might be 5 millibars, it might be 10 or whatever else, divided by the saturation vapor pressure. So if I give you a temperature, you need to therefore think about how much water vapor could potentially be in the air. And that's why when we have low relative humidity, it feels really dry because evaporation happens really easily because what's actually in the air is really, really low compared to what we could have. And so the rate of evaporation is really high compared to the rate of condensation. So let's have a go at calculating this because I like these questions, okay? Um, so here's my little parcel of air again. And this time it's at 20 degrees Celsius and it has maybe 10 millibars of vapor pressure. So all I'm doing there is looking at that one point and reading off what temperature and what vapor pressure is in it, okay? So that 10 millibars is my actual vapor pressure. It's what would go on my top of my formula there, 10 millibars. But then I need to divide that by the saturation vapor pressure. So how do I work out my saturation vapor pressure? I, well, it only depends on temperature, right? So I need to go to my 20 degrees Celsius, and I need to think, well, how much water vapor could we get in here if we tried? And if you follow up that line from 20 degrees Celsius, where it crosses that red line, if you read across, we could potentially get 20 millibars of vapor pressure in there if we wanted to, if we had the chance. And that's our saturation vapor pressure. So if we divide that 10, which is actually what's in it, by the 20, which is what we could have in it, and times by 100%, we get 50% relative humidity. So pretty comfortable. So prove to me that you can do this now. So here's my parcel of air is at 30 degrees Celsius, and vapor pressure is now 20 millibars. So first of all, work out where on the graph that little place would plot. Okay, so work out what your actual vapor pressure is, what your saturation vapor pressure is, and see if you can do the calculation. Okay? And you can speak to your neighbors if you'd like to ask their opinion.
Okay, a few more seconds for the last uh, answers. Okay, let's take a look. Ooh, good work, guys. Great. Okay, yes. And I'll tell you why. Because our actual vapor pressure is 20. And our saturation vapor pressure, if we follow up that line from 30 degrees, we get something around 40 millibars. 20 divided by 40 times by 100% is equal to 50%. Okay? So you'll have a chance to practice this in the quiz this week. Okay. So, we have two ways that we can therefore saturate water, or we can create condensation, okay? Um, and that first one is to add water vapor to the air. Well, that's great, but we have a lot of land surface. How are we going to add water vapor when air is really high up? Okay, so that's not necessarily the easiest way of uh, getting our, our air to be saturated with water vapor. The other way we could do it is by decreasing the temperature of the air. And that's somewhat easier for us to do um, over land. So I want to talk to you about ways of changing air temperature. So I've got a whole bunch of things here. So first of all, just by absorbing radiation or losing radiation, conduction, sensible heat, things like that, that would change the temperature. We could mix air together by convection. We could mix nice warm air with cold air or whatever else. Remember, we can change the phase of water that either absorbs energy, which would cool the surrounding air, or it releases energy, which would heat the surrounding air. But the key thing about all of these different processes is that they involve some sort of transfer of energy, either convection, conduction, radiation, latent heat, sensible heat. They all involve some sort of transfer of energy. And we call those diabatic processes. Diabatic processes. But I want to introduce you to another idea, which is that we can change the temperature of our air. Can you be quiet at the back, please? We can change the temperature of the air just by changing the pressure, so by expanding it or compressing it. So if we compress air, it heats up. If we expand air, it cools down. And has anyone ever played with an air duster to try and clear out their laptop or anything else? Yeah? What happens when you squeeze this? It gets cold, OK? If you don't believe me, someone can have a go. Here you are, have a go. Prove to them that I'm not lying. Squeeze it, and what happens? <laughs> so if you squeeze it there. OK, keep going. What happens to the can? <laughs> it gets cold, I promise. OK. So yes, absolutely. But I have a more exciting example, which is my one and only magic trick for the quarter. And I know that a lot of people have seen this before, perhaps. I have a soda bottle. In my soda bottle, I have a water substitute, which is methanol, because it has a slightly lower uh, temperature. And we're going to combine a whole bunch of stuff today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the pressure in this bottle with this bicycle pump. If I'm compressing the air in here, what am I doing to the temperature? I'm increasing the temperature. If I'm increasing the temperature, how much evaporation can occur? How much um, of my little liquid in the bottom here could get into the atmosphere? More. Okay? I'll take more as an answer. So. What might happen as I release the pressure? OK? So talk amongst yourselves for a second while I try and pump this. Oh, it's not going to work. Hang on. Oh. Okay, are you ready? Ooh, magic. No, it's science. Okay, which is that as I increase the temperature in my bottle, I got evaporation of the liquid that's in the base there. When I release that pressure, what did I do to the temperature? 
I cool it down, but as the air can suddenly expand, it's cooling down. What am I doing on my saturation graph? I'm moving towards saturation, just like we said, how much would it have to cool down by to get to saturation? Okay? And this is how clouds are formed, basically. Because what happens to pressure as we go up in the atmosphere? It decreases. So if we lift up air to higher in the atmosphere, it's going to expand and we get clouds. Okay? So that's where I wanted to get to for today. I can do it one more time if people would like. Yes? Okay. I'll show you something else neat at the end as well. Ready? Okay. Now watch what happens to it as I pump the air back in. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday.